Okay, has started. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to you and turn my camera off so you can do your thing. Thanks again, Savannah, for being with us. And yeah, if anybody has questions, just pop them in the chat. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So like Elise said, today I'm gonna to talk about some invasive pests and diseases, and I'm gonna be able to give you some background information, how to identify them in the field, and then also go over some control methods. So I'm only gonna go over two invasives we currently have in Vermont, and then two that are on the horizon for us. So spongy moth and beech leaf disease are established in the state. We do not yet have oak will or spotted lanternfly. So let's start with spongy moth. Spongy moth is an invasive hardwood defoliator that's native to Europe and Asia that has been reported in North America since the late 1800s. This pest was originally introduced to Massachusetts during the Civil War as a potential silk producer for military uniforms. It then escaped captivity and quickly became established. This insect spreads locally as adults by flight. Um, as larvae, they actually spin some silk and they balloon on these silk strands um, and then long distances by human assisted transport. This pest follows an outbreak cycle with populations reaching outbreak levels every 10 to 15 years, <clears throat> excuse me, and then an outbreak lasting anywhere between three and five years. So spongy moth has one generation per year, meaning it's gonna hatch, mate, and die all within this time frame. The eggs are laid in late summer and fall. They're, they are the life stage that overwinter, so they're not gonna hatch until spring. These egg masses are soft and spongy in texture and can be laid on really any flat surface, not just their preferred host trees. A single egg mass has anywhere between 400 and 600 individual eggs. Um, and when these eggs hatch, small larvae emerge. So they immediately find their way to their host spe species and start defoliating leaves. They will molt a couple times by June, um, and this really causes substantial defoliation when populations reach outbreak levels. So by midsummer, spongy moths will pupate and then emerge later as adults. So here's the distribution of spongy moth in the United States. It's currently established in 20 states and Washington, D.C. This pest does have a federal quarantine associated with it, which is shown in the dark blue on this map. Um, in Vermont, we do have spongy moth in all counties. So if you're in this dark blue area, which all of Vermont is, um, you are legally required to check your belongings, goods, and plant material for spongy moth life stages before moving out of the quarantine area. So if you're going camping, if you're in the nursery industry shipping plants, um, you should really be going through this APHIS provided self-inspection checklist. Um, and this usually stays on your person during the transport of any of these materials. So although we do have confirmed spongy moth in all counties in Vermont, aerial survey data showed that population density and therefore defoliation for this most recent outbreak was much more centralized in the Champlain Valley of Western Vermont. We didn't fly in 2020 due to COVID restrictions, but in 2021, we observed over 50,000 acres of defoliation, which then decreased to 42,000 acres in 2022. And then actually this year, we only, well, in 2023, we only had 98 acres of defoliation, and it's actually too small um, quantity of acres to show up on our aerial survey mapping program. So this is just showing that populations from this current outbreak crashed dramatically. Each winter, our forest health team conducts egg mass surveys across the state to anticipate population levels and defoliation. This graph is a little deceiving because it uses a logarithmic scale, but as you can see, counts in 2020 were the highest in the past 30 years, with peaking egg mass counts in 2021, where we had 262 egg masses per plot. We did see dramatically lower egg mass counts this past winter, with only about 0.5 egg masses per plot, um, so we're not predicting significant defoliation in 2024, and I feel comfortable stating that this most recent outbreak is over. Here's a regular line graph for the last few years, which is a little easier to see this stark increase and then decrease in our egg mass counts. So even though we're not currently in an outbreak, spongy moth is still going to cause defoliation where it's present. Um, this is an invasive, so just because the populations have crashed doesn't mean that they're not existent in Vermont. There's a few things that can be done locally to manage this insect in our urban settings. Caterpillars can be squished or pruned out of trees and then submerged in soapy water. 
In the fall, egg masses can also be scraped and submerged, or you can squish them with the back of your nail or maybe with a credit card, and you'll actually hear like a popping sound, and that kills them. I have personally found that tree wraps are really low effort but high reward um, management technique for your high value trees in urban landscapes. Upside down duct tape can be installed in the spring on the trunk and maybe some lower branches of your high value trees. And then when the caterpillars crawl up the trunk to feed, um, they're going to get stuck and die. I don't really recommend using a sticky band because wildlife tends to get stuck on those. And for spongy moth, it's not really needed because they're so hairy, they stick to the duct tape very well. You will need to replace the duct tape every few days and especially after any periods of rainfall. I wanted to include burlap bands here just because if you do some Googling, this is something you'll see very commonly. They're not great for catching caterpillars. Um, caterpillars will seek out this burlap as a protective covering between feeding. So they'll go up um, and feed and then come back down the tree and try to hide from predators during the day. Um, but they're going to crawl in and out of it. There's nothing keeping them inside of this burlap. But if you do choose to install burlap, doing it um, this year will encourage your adult spongy moths to actually seek it out and lay their eggs in this protective covering. Um, and then at the end of the season, before spring, uh, you can actually just remove the burlap and you'd be able to remove a pretty good amount of egg masses. And as you remember, when I was talking about them earlier, we have 400 to 600 eggs per egg mass. So even if you got rid of a couple on your property, um, three egg masses could be 1,800 eggs and larva. Um, so that, that number can really add up. BTK is a commonly um, and naturally occurring bacteria. It occurs in soils and on plants throughout the world and is used as a biological insecticide for spongy moth. Widespread use of BTK to control spongy moth began in the 1970s. The caterpillars need to be actively feeding on leaves that have been covered with BTK in order to consume a lethal dose of BTK. All Lepidoptera are susceptible to this bacteria, um, but only Lepidoptera. So if you choose to use this on your property, um, it's really important to know that it needs to interact with this particular enzyme inside of a Lepidoptera's digestive tract, which then activates it and causes mortality. So if this gets accidentally sprayed on your garden and your cat gets in there or you're eating something, it's really not going to be causing mortality um, in these doses. It's really, we don't have the enzyme that causes the lethal dose. There are a few wasp parasitoids that will parasitize spongy moths. Um, the first one on the left is pretty specific to spongy moth and is actually present in Vermont. Um, the one on the right is a little less common because it's uh, less successful outside of the lab setting, but I wanted to include it to show that there are some predators out there. And these tiny wasps are actually laying um, eggs inside of spongy moth eggs where they're gonna hatch out and consume the spongy moth. Our most successful bio biological control agents in Vermont are the NPV virus and the fungal pathogen Antimophaga myomyga. NPV virus is typically more active when caterpillar populations are high, um, and when infected, it's going to cause caterpillars to climb to really elevated positions during the day, and then they're going to arch backwards and liquefy and die. So the caterpillars infected with this virus actually arches back kind of in this V shape when they're dying, and that's just to allow the liquid contents of the caterpillar to rain onto leaves. Um, and then the other caterpillars that are still defoliating your trees are then going to consume these leaves um, with other liquefied remains on them and get infected with this virus. The fungal pathogen Antimophaga myomyga is much more active when we have wet and humid springs. This pathogen infects caterpillars through its soft body where it's going to grow and digest the insect from the inside. Uh, the dead caterpillars get really long and skinny and then the spores are dispersed which either are going to reinfect other caterpillars that are crawling around or they're going to overwinter in the soil and wait until conditions are more favorable. Both of these biocontrols can exist in the same stand on the same tree, um, and that's kind of what's shown in this last picture here. We did have a wet spring in 2023, which really helped to knock down populations. In 2022, when I gave this presentation, or a similar one, uh, we expected to see some defoliation because we had about 62 egg masses per plot. Uh, but 
as you saw a few slides ago, we recorded almost no defoliation. And this was because once the eggs hatched, these bio biological controls were actually really able to knock down those populations quickly. So the next established evasive I want to talk about today is beech leaf disease. So beech leaf disease is a novel disease affecting all beaches in North America. So this is going to include your American, European, Oriental, and Chinese beach. This disease was first observed in Ohio in 2012 and was unfortunately detected in Vermont in 2023. Now, beech leaf disease is not actually a disease like its common name suggests. Um, it's actually damage that's associated with a newly recognized subspecies of a leaf gall nematode, which is Lydialynchus crenate messini. So nematode infection mechanisms are not fully understood yet, uh, but new research is indicating that the nematode is associated with buds and leaves of beech trees of all age classes. So here's an electron scan microscope image of this nematode. Um, since this is a new pest, the spread of it's not yet known. It's possible that it can be spread by birds feeding on infested beech buds, by humans transporting infected plant material, through beech clone clusters along an interlocking root graft, or even by wind and rain splash. So what does beech leaf disease look like? In early stages of infestations, beech leaves begin to develop the striping pattern in between leaf veins as shown in these pictures. These bands are gonna be visible immediately upon bud break in the spring, and they actually don't progress in severity throughout the growing season. In early infestations, these affected leaves may be unevenly distributed in the lower canopy, uh, but the best way to see them is from viewing from below. So if you go underneath the tree and you look upwards into the canopy, in more severe infestations, um, the darker area is going to be observed as slightly raised and thicker than normal tissue, and this is sometimes referred to as leathery banding, um, and this can cause leaf deformation. This severe symptom often leads to chlorotic banding, which is later in the season, um, and that can get to like a yellow color, and you can also have premature leaf drop. Now, leaves with light, medium, or heavy symptoms of infestations, as well as leaves that don't look symptomatic at all, they just look like a regular beech leaf, can all occur not only on the same tree, but actually on the same branch. It's thought that this nematode is overwintering inside of the buds, and they actually affect the leaves before the bud break in the spring. So because of this, this can also cause aborted buds, which will be crispy and empty buds at the end of an infected branch, again, leading to dieback and mortality. So over time, infestations can lead to mortality, which is going to happen to all age classes. And mortality is typically observed within two to seven years, but can be much more common in smaller trees and then trees with other stressors, such as beech bark disease. So here's the original distribution map by year that was posted in 2019. Notice that it first started in Ohio in 2012, but we had another pop-up detection in New York and Connecticut in 2019. We're not really sure at this time if this was just missed observations or if this was a secondary introduction. Um, DNA work is ongoing to see if these populations are actually genetically different or not. As you can see in 2020, we then added Massachusetts and Rhode Island to the map. In 2021, Maine was added. Um, the Maine detection is potentially a third introduction. Again, DNA work is gonna be ongoing just because there's no other detection at this time made between Northeastern Mass um, and New Hampshire. Also in 2021, many Eastern states, including Vermont, set up monitoring plots to track the spread and mortality of beech leaf disease. So this is this could have contributed to filling in some of these gaps between detections, especially what we're seeing through Pennsylvania. Here's the distribution map of beech leaf disease in North America from February of 2023. So this is all of the 2022 data. Beech leaf disease was detected in 12 states in Ontario, Canada. Um, and as you can see, New Hampshire was added to the map. And now this is the most current recent distribution in North America from December of this past year. We added three states, which was Maryland, West Virginia, and unfortunately us in Vermont. So now we have 15 states and Ontario, Canada. So in Vermont, we've had two detections in Wyndham County. The reports came from public observations using VT invasives and contacting our forest health team directly. Here are a few samples from the site in Vernon. 
unfortunately, these symptoms are pretty severe. I'd call this a heavy infestation, which may indicate that this was a several a several year infestation. Um, nematode DNA from this site was actually also isolated from completely asymptomatic leaves on abutting trees. So even though they didn't show symptoms this year, we're anticipating um, they're going to be showing symptoms this growing season. There are a few things that look similar to beech leaf disease symptoms. A very common one is uranium mite patches. If we have a wet spring or summer, like we did last year, we do get increased reports of the fungal pathogen anthracnose. Um, aphid feeding can cause infested leaves to curl or roll. And then lastly, herbicide injury can cause some deformation and chlorotic banding as well. If you're unsure if you have beech leaf disease or one of these lookalikes, you can just take a picture or a sample and report it anyway. Uh, we'd always much rather get additional reports than risk miss missing an early detection report. So what's currently being done to control and or eradicate this disease? Currently, the main thing being done is research. There's so much unknown about this complex that a lot of time and resources are being devoted to it at the university, state, and federal levels. Several states have suggested the use of quarantines to slow the spread into new counties and states. However, again, because the vector is unknown, it's really hard to regulate. Some studies are looking into increasing genetic diversity of beech on the landscape, as well as selectively breeding for resistance. Many of you know this already, but beech trees love to sucker, meaning that every new sucker which grows into a tree is going to have those identical genetics to the host tree. Um, and if there is some resistance to beech leaf disease, that could either be good or bad. Um, I do want to mention in the upcoming slides just a few pesticide management suggestions you can find online. I am not endorsing either of these products. I just want to share these with you so you have the most up-to-date information so you're able to make your own informed decision. Also, a disclaimer that in Vermont, when we are talking about pesticides, the label is the law. So the first is phosphites or polyphosphite 30. This is a potassium fertilizer that's used as a fungicide. So Ohio research researchers have been treating beech trees that are infested with beech leaf disease with this fertilizer and have been able to know a decrease in nematode populations and an increase in health and vigor over five years compared to untreated trees. Trees in this experiment did not have beech bark disease, which is something most Vermont beech trees do unfortunately have. Other scientists who have replicated their experiment have had pretty considerably different results. This is probably due to the fact that it's a fungicide and beech leaf disease is a nematode. Again, it's just worth noting that positive results are likely just a result of increased health and vigor. Fertilizers help to stimulate the tree's natural defenses, and if you're increasing a tree's overall health and vigor, they're just much better at dealing with pests and pathogens. Another pesticide you may find online uh, contains the active ingredient phylopram. Now, this is a foliar nematicide uh, that also has pretty varying results in regard to beech leaf disease control. This nematicide is effective for other plant parasitic nematodes, uh, but it doesn't always kill the egg stage. And this is really problematic for beech leaf disease uh, because they have a staggered development. So the Lydia lingus crinate mycenae has a staggered development. So adults, juveniles, and eggs are all going to be existing at the same time in a leaf, um, unlike a pest that maybe has one or two very distinct generations per year. So the next invasive I want to talk about today is oak wilt. So oak wilt is a vascular tree disease of oak, which causes rapid decline in mortality in your infected hosts. Due to the fast progression of this disease, it's thought to be introduced to the United States. However, its exact origin is unknown. Uh, this pathogen was first documented in Wisconsin in 1944 and has currently not been observed in Vermont. Although this pathogen can affect all species of oak, white oak family members have been found to be more resistant to this pathogen due to their ability to utilize tyloses during compartmentalization. For those of you unfamiliar with tyloses, it's basically just an outgrowth of cells that block conducting vessels within the tree, and this just helps stop the spread of a pathogen. Red oak family members don't utilize these tyloses, so the infection often leads to rapid mortality because the pathogen is inside the vascular system and therefore spreads quickly throughout the tree. So this pathogen spreads large distances through a variety of bark and sap feeding beetles. 
Here's a really great poster that New York DEC published recently showing what nitidulid beetles can vector, aka spread this pathogen. Uh, the oak leaf in the center does throw the scale off a little bit, but the scale is on the bottom right um, and it shows five millimeters. So for perspective, like the average grain of rice is about five to seven millimeters long. So the average vector here is about the size of a grain of rice. So locally, this pathogen spreads through root grafts that oaks make with each other. And then lastly, like all invasives, humans assist the spread. Uh, we typically move infected firewood or wood products long distances. So this pathogen has currently been reported in 24 states, with the most recent being in New York in 2008 and Ontario, Canada in 2023. Uh, the closest infestation to Vermont is Glenville, New York, and that was detected in 2013. So this pathogen is an ascomycota, which indicates that its asexual life cycle will have asexual fruiting bodies called conidia and conidia spores, and then it also has a sexual life cycle that produces sexual fruiting bodies, which are the parathesia and ascospores. Both the asexual and sexual life cycles are over land, which just means that's what you're going to notice in the tree. So if you look at this life cycle to the right, you'll notice a depiction of a wilted tree. Next, there are fruiting bodies in a hyphal mat, and this is what's producing the spores. These spores are then picked up by an insect accidentally and then brought to a healthy tree or an asymptomatic tree. Um, and when the insects are actually feeding on the tree, they're causing damage and inoculating the tree with the fungi. Uh, this fungi is then able to establish successfully and then continue this cycle. As I mentioned in the last slide, it's also vectored to other oaks through root grafts, uh, which is underground and really hard to detect. Um, and that's just what this bottom cycle is showing. So you have a healthy tree that is connected to um, a tree that has oak wilt and it's able to spread them through the roots. So now that you have a little bit better background on oak wilt, we can talk about what it looks like in the field. As I previously mentioned, symptom progression is gonna differ based on oak family with red oak family members having rapid onset and mortality. And this is typically gonna happen over a single growing season. So if you think about a really huge, probably the biggest red oak you've ever seen in your life, um, that can die within three months of being infected with the oak wilt pathogen. It's very aggressive. Early detection is going to indicate that the outer margins of the leaves are wilted and discolored. This is going to lead to early leaf drop, which happens during the growing season and gives the tree um, a fall like appearance in the middle of the summer. In the middle of the summer. With leaf drop, branch mortality will progress from the outward extremities and then progress downward and inward. If you scrape back the sunken areas on the bowl, which is what's shown in figure, shown in figure A, uh, in the middle, you'll find uh, fungal middle, mats that are beneath the bark, um, and that's what's shown in figure B, as well as xylem streaking within the wood. In our white oak family members, this pathogen has a much slower onset and symptom progression. Similar to red oaks, they do share the early detection, indicating that the margins of the leaves are wilted and discolored. You'll get that early leaf drop in this fall-like appearance in the summer. But again, what makes white oak family members unique is the utilization of tyloses and compartmentalization. So like I previously mentioned, tyloses are just outgrowths on parenchyma cells of the xylem vessels that aid in the containment of pests and pathogen damage. These tyloses are why we use white oak family members to make wine barrels and corks, because they just add an extra layer of sealing to the compartmentalization process. So since white oak family members are better at compartmentalization because they have these tyloses, oak wilt's not able to spread as quickly or aggressively. Um, however, they are sacrificing more functional xylem tissue in order to stop this pathogen from spreading. So sacrificing more of this xylem tissue is disrupting and reducing the water and mineral transport, which is gonna cause white oak family members to have more dieback. So this compartmentalization strategy also affects your ability to see xylem streaking, um, as well as the fungal mats. So in red oak family members, those symptoms are gonna be much more apparent, but in white oak family members, you're most likely gonna see your dieback symptoms. So what can be done to control and or eradicate this pathogen? Well, educating the public and landowners is an efficient way to reduce its spread because education not only serves as a preventative measure for not moving this pathogen into the state, but it also helps us have early detections and rapid response. So if you find a single tree, we can respond quickly and we can help prevent its spread throughout the site or even throughout the state. 
Something you can also become familiar with is how to report a sighting on VT invasives and then also show others how to report on VT invasives. Um, you can also stop moving firewood. This is something that's really hard to control, but the best bet is always to buy it where you burn it. Um, and lastly, educating the public on the disease cycle to help prevent its spread. So this pathogen is often spread by insect feeding. So any open wound on an oak tree can actually attract these sap feeding nidadulid beetles within 10 minutes. That's not a lot of time. Uh, so during peak beetle emergence, which is typically between April and July, we really recommend not harvesting, uh, pruning or wounding your oaks. And then the best time to harvest prune and wound would be in the winter time. So like November through March when these beetles are overwintering. In the state of Vermont, we conduct aerial surveys and we also respond to public reports. Trees that are reported get surveyed by either myself or another protection staff member. And if we think it's suspect, we'll actually collect samples and send it off to Cornell for PCR testing. Um, and this is just what that looks like. We typically take several Ziploc bags of material, we mail them off, and then Cornell is going to plate the fungi. So that's what you see in this Petri dish here to see if it grows oak will. And then they'll take a little chunk of that and DNA confirm it with PCR testing. So host removal and destruction is also a viable control effort, although it can be costly, and this is especially in your forested settings. So if you can't remove the entire tree and root system, a cheaper alternative would be to sever any root grafts by installing a plow line around an infection center. And that's what this person in this machine is doing. Uh, this is just disrupting root grafts and then pre preventing that underground spread. If you can remove the entire tree, you're going to be able to destroy the fungal mats inside. You're going to be destroying any beetles that are overwintering um, inside of the oaks, and this will help slow the overland spread before their emergence in the spring. Again, if possible, we really want the root system to be removed. In cases where the root system can't be, herbicides can be used to kill off the roots within a buffer zone of an oak will infection center, um, and this just reduces the likelihood it's going to be able to graft to another tree. So the last pest I want to talk about today that we also don't have in Vermont is spotted lanternfly. So the first thing I want to clarify with this insect, again, the common name is a little misnomer, similar to beech leaf disease. This is actually a plant hopper, which is a type of true bug and is not a fly or a moth. So this insect is native to China, India, Vietnam, and parts of Asia and was first discovered in Pennsylvania in 2014. Since then, it has been documented as an introduced invasive with the ability to travel long distances by humans. One of its preferred hosts is Tree of Heaven, which is another introduced invasive plant from Asia. Um, but although preferred, this insect has been reported on more than 100 plant species, which include grapes, hops, and maples. Despite their broad host range, some plants appear to be more favorable to spot and lanternfly than others. Um, and host preference has been linked to life stage. So for nymphs, which I'll show in the next couple slides, um, they have an especially large host range that's gonna include perennials and any new and tender plant growth, whereas the adults seem to depend more on certain hosts that are primarily woody stems of trees and then mature vines similar to grapes. So here's the distribution map of spotted lanternfly in the United States from October of 2023. The blue indicates infestations of spotted lanternfly and the purple dots indicate where spotted lanternfly has been found, but no infestation has developed. Um, as you can see, Vermont is on this map. We've had two um, purple dots, so we've had two live interceptions within the state. However, we've had no population established yet. So we've been checking these areas with traps and increased surveys. Um, but we haven't been able to find that these adults or the live interceptions have resulted in an infestation. So the spotted lanternfly has one generation per year. The eggs, similar to spongy moth, overwinter and hatch in the spring. As you can see in this picture, they are very hard to detect in both fresh and early stages. So it's thought that uh, spotted lanternfly actually came over on a shipment of loose gravel um, on a ship. And honestly, I could see how that would get past. Um, so the first one is a fresh egg mass, and that has a mud-like covering, and that's protecting the eggs from predators as well as harsh environmental conditions. Um, later in the season, and especially after they hatch, you'll see what's in the second picture here where it's a cracked mud-like. Um, and then spotted lanternflies actually lay their eggs in these vertical rows, which are very distinct. 
So when the eggs hatch, the early stage black and white nymphs, which is shown on the top of the screen, emerge. And these are usually found in summer and they're going to have three instars. So they're going to start out very small. They actually are, they get mistaken really easily in the nursery setting for ticks, um, but then they're going to molt a couple times. So they're going to just get larger, um, about a quarter of an inch. The fourth nymph instar um, that's red and white, and that's going to be found later in the summer. And then the last two pictures are of adults with their wings open and closed, uh, which can be found between summer and early winter. So these adults are weak flyers, but they do use their wings to help them jump. So if you don't see any of those life stages, there are additional things you can be looking for. Um, feeding from host plants are going to cause ooze or a weeping, which have fermented odor. Um, they're also feeding and pooping, and they're pooping out a sugary secretion known as honeydew. Um, and this is going to cause an increase in wasp and ant activity. The buildup of the sticky fluid on plants and on the ground underneath the plants might also get overgrown with sooty mold, which is this black stuff you're looking at the tree right here. Um, in the fall, adults are going to um, tend to aggregate together to breed, and then they're going to lay eggs on your host plants. Here's a few things that look like spotted lanternfly, uh, the adult harness tiger moth, the adult box elder bug, and then again, the spongy moth egg masses look similar to the fresh egg mass of spotted lanternfly. Outside of education and prevention, um, sticky bands are a great control method that can be used by homeowners for localized populations. Spotted lanternfly nymphs and adults both instinctively travel up the tree. So this is a cheap and effective way to catch them in your urban localized settings. This behavior of why they travel up the tree is still being researched. They could be doing this possibly to feed on the thinner barked areas or use it as a launching post to hitch a ride in the wind. Cause again, they're kind of clunky, heavy flyers. When you do, if you choose to apply sticky bands um, to trap any type of pest, and especially with spotted lanternfly here, you should always cover it with chicken wire so that birds and small mammals don't get stuck and die. This, the stuff that you can buy commercially from like Ace Hardware and stuff, this is very sticky. Circle or funnel traps are a method that's becoming more popular because it's safer for those non-target animals. Here you take nylon or maybe some type of fine mesh wire, and then you can either wrap a section of the tree or wrap around the entire tree and create a funnel where a spotted lanternfly gets channeled into a bag or another type of container. Um, both the sticky bands and traps will probably not significantly reduce the greater populations of nymphs outside of the trap area, and it's not really likely you're going to reduce the number of adults that you see later in the year, um, but it can help out your high value localized trees. There are a few contact pesticides that are commercially available for spotted lanternfly nymph and adult control. Uh, the next fall couple tables are from Penn State Extension. It's important to remember that if you're trying to control spotted lanternfly for the entire season, um, you're going to have to repeat applications if you're choosing to use a contact pesticide because this type of pesticide varies in residual effective effectiveness and then any new spotted lanternfly uh, will either move on to new plants or not come in contact with the insecticide um, if they're coming onto a treated area. Systemic insecticides are another control option available for spotted lanternfly. Again, this is from Penn State Extension, and it does have two familiar insecticides, which is the dinotefrin and imidacloprid. Systemic insecticides move through the plant's vascular system after application, and it kills target insects when they feed on the treated host plant. So unlike your contact insecticides, this only affects feeding insects. However, its residues can contaminate flowers, so it's really best practice to treat your high value trees after blooming periods to really try to help protect pollinators and other non-target beneficial insects. In their native range, spotted lanternfly has natural enemies that keep populations in check. Uh, the first one is an egg parasitoid. This has been reported to parasitize about 30% of egg masses, and then when in those egg masses, up to about 40% of the eggs. Another wasp um, is a nymph parasitoid, and that's what's shown in the middle here. In China, it's been reported to parasitize 40% of the second and third instar nymphs. Currently, both of these um, are going under testing with APHIS in several US states just to test out their host specificity before we can consider releasing them in the United States. 
Um, the last one, the last photo here is actually a spongy moth parasitoid. Um, and there is some research coming out of Penn State Extension um, that is showing that the spongy moth parasitoid that we do have in Vermont is parasitizing about 7% of egg masses um, of spotted lanternfly. And although that is pretty low, it is still cool that it is. Uh, this picture just shows a spongy moth parasitoid on the back of a spotted lanternfly adult, which is kind of strange and is not how it's attacking it because it's it's going after the egg stage, but I thought it was a pretty neat picture. It's also worth noting that spotted lanternfly will sparsely get eaten by birds, praying mantises, spiders, and assassin bugs, but that's never going to be in the quantities enough to curb their populations, which is why they're an invasive. There are several fungal pathogens that have started to be researched for their use as biocontrol agents. Um, the first one here, we have Buberia, um, and this attacks both nymphs and adults. Uh, there's also research going on for another Antimophaga species. Um, remember, we talked about Antimophaga myomiga with spongy moth. Um, there's different species. Antimophaga is the genus, so a different species that can attack spider lanternflies adults. Um, so both of these are actually also going under testing with APHIS just to test their host specificity and their effectiveness long term. So here's my contact information if you wanted to reach out. Um, if you think you've seen these invasives, please submit a report. If you think you might have, but you're not sure, like I said earlier, please report it anyway. Um, I'd always much rather get additional reports than risk any early detection report. Um, and I think we have enough time to take questions if there's any. We do indeed have about uh, 20 minutes left for questions. There were, were two that came in during your, your presentation, Savannah. The first um, from Adam McCullough, he asks, love the duct tape solution. This is way back when you're talking about spongy moth. Does it catch maple leaf cutters? No. Yeah. Easy so answer. maple leaf cutter <laughs> is in um, traveling up and down the stem. They're a, fol a foliar insect. Great. OK, and then second question from Crisioli. Hi, Chris. Uh, is there any limitation to BLD due to weather? Is it cold hardy? Is it wet or dry condition hardy? Right now, they don't know. Most nematodes do need um, water of some kind in order to spread or uh, transport through an organism, um, but we see nematodes virtually in and on every living organism or natural thing. So it's in the soil, there's nematodes in trees that are fine. There's nematodes in snow and on flowers and mushrooms. Um, a lot of research is going on right now because we're just not sure. We're not sure how this is spreading. And now that we've seen it in Ontario, Canada, uh, we, we feel a little bit more comfortable thinking that it will spread throughout the entire state of same with the detections in Maine. Summer news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, anybody else have questions? We've got some time left. Um, certainly don't need to stay the whole hour if there aren't any questions, but um, we'll, we'll stick on if anybody else has anything to ask. Once. Well, you might have just satiated everybody's brains <laughs> with everything they need to know. Um, so I uh, want to say thank you to Savannah for for doing the, this for us this afternoon. Um, yeah, everything everything you need to know uh, is on VT Invasives and uh, always, always a pleasure, Savannah. I'm going to um, just remind folks one more time if you came in later that if you need pesticides, nobody put their number in, so if you need pesticides, uh, credits if you're a certified applicator um, shoot me an email potentially or just I'll stay on for a couple more minutes um, with your app or your certificate number and your full name oh one more question from Chris real quick how soon after an oak is infected do you need to do a root printing pruning um, as soon as you're able to confirm that you have oak will, I would suggest implementing management strategies immediately. Um, if you are in Vermont, I would love to be notified of that because it's something we want to be able to help confirm with you. Um, but it, it spreads so rapidly and it's so aggressive that it's it's worth doing right away. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, if you have other questions, reach out to Savannah. 
directly. Her information is on that last slide, and uh, we will send a follow up email to all registered participants with the recording so you can watch it again. <laughs> all right, have a wonderful day, everybody. Thanks again, Savannah. Yeah, thank you.